Folks, we've talked a lot about the uprisings in the Middle East in recent weeks in Libya, in Egypt, in Syria. And if you saw yesterday's broadcast, you would know that we spoke with the international Alex Mihailovic about something that, frankly, was news to this program. It might have been to you, too. hope it was. Uh, about folks who actually go around organizing these protests and these uprisings throughout the Middle East. Well, frankly, throughout the world. This is an industry, and this has got a rich history, and we have wondered just how much these folks, these folks who do professional protesting, who, who organize groups in, in countries where there's unrest, how much they've had to do with what we've been covering over the last several weeks in the Middle East. To talk about this, we're joined from Ottawa by Shuvaloy Majumdar. He is our foreign policy contributor. He is um, with the Hurria Initiative at the University of British Columbia. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Shuv, for being with us. Glad to be here, Theo. How are you? No, good, thanks. Now, you heard the intro talking about what, as I say, was, was a, a novel concept, I think, for a lot of people. The fact that there are folks who go around and assist, facilitate um, uprisings in various parts of the world. What can you tell us about it? Well, <clears throat> uh, if anything, it speaks to a demand around the world for this kind of technical assistance in terms of how to organize political movements, how to mobilize elements of civil society, support independent media, uh, and broadly empower the democratic aspirations of people around the world, not even to a particular region. Uh, about 25 years ago, President Reagan was so impressed with Solidarity, the labor organization in Poland, uh, that he had created and established what was called then the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, four core institutes comprise that endowment. Uh, the Center for International Private Enterprise, which establishes chambers of commerce. Uh, the AFL-CIO's affiliate for Solidarity International, which works with labor unions overseas. And two party-based institutes, the National Democratic Institute and my old home, the International Republican Institute. Uh, they all work in a nonpartisan way to promote democracy overseas. Um, they work with aspiring Democrats in all types of cultures and societies in over 74 countries around the world and have a 24, 25 year old history in doing this type of, uh, this type of work. Uh, there are some contracting organizations like the ones that Sun News had reported yesterday, uh, but the broad thrust, the center of gravity of this type of assistance is done through um, the non-governmental framework of this national endowment and its core institutes. Well, you know, I'm not surprised to hear that labor organizations have this international component. I think nobody is. I mean, the, half the time it's in the name, International Brotherhood of whatever. But, you know, the question we've been asking, Shuv, about the uprisings in Libya and Egypt and Syria, uh, you know, elsewhere, um, are, who are the folks behind this? Because we want to know genuinely, are the people you right. see in the streets, uh, particularly Syria the, w these weeks, but, you know, any of these countries, are they citizens who have been repressed, who are rallying for freedom? Are they in some measure fundamentalist or jihadist elements? But mm -hmm. I think it, it at least exposes some light on them to say that, in some cases at least, these are not just spontaneous uprisings, these are organized and orchestrated by outside groups. I think I reject that uh, okay. uh, that premise, and, and the reason I reject that is because of uh, having worked in the Middle East practically for the last four years on these types of initiatives with aspiring Democrats. Uh, I have affirmed the notion that the idea of liberty itself is not exclusive to one part of the world or one region of our thinking. Uh, liberty in its very heart is accessible to all. It's written into the hearts and aspirations of what we all have uh, in our expectations of government and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a mixture of agendas that aim to compete for hegemony, but in places like Egypt or Syria or Libya, uh, I fully believe that these are ordinary people who aspire for the same things that you and I do uh, in terms of access to quality education, representative government, constitutional rights. This is not something that I buy into the myth of being exclusive to one part of the world. Uh, I, I do think there is an element of extremism or fundamentalism at play. Without a doubt, there is a, a healthy dose of realism that ought to inform how we approach these types of countries and, and the region at large. But these ways of dem democratization have been cascading for quite some time. The first one would have been the French and English revolutions, the American revolutions. Um, then the second wave in the industry, it's broadly termed to be in the aftermath of the Second World War, when we were s establishing multilateral institutions to abate uh, a nuclear war and preserve some kind of peace uh, in, the, in the ashes of the World War. 
The third wave came with the fall of Russia. And today, what we're beginning to witness in the Middle East is what is notionally considered to be the fourth wave of democratization in a part of the world that has never known freedom before. Okay. Well, Shuv, I'm trying to decide how much of a fight I want to have with you right now. The, <laughs> because, look, the idea that liberty is written into every human heart is something that, with which this program agrees, because I just, I think that. And I don't want to get you in touch with your Ottawa pals, but George W. Bush used to say something similar. But that's it, not mutually exclusive to what has been suggested, Shuv. You can still have people wanting to have freedom and, and you know, as, as is human nature, but still have these uprising orchestrated by people who do that for a living. And you mentioned, you know, various other revolutions. I mean, for example, you mentioned the French and the American Revolution, and I kind of noticed the way you put them together like they're the same thing. They aren't. The French Revolution being a brutal experiment in making the state, the deity, a disgraceful uh, affair, whereas the American Revolution, this is what's germane to the discussion, was an experiment in liberty. And in that case, you had a third of the country that wanted to stay loyal to Britain. You had a third of the country that wanted its own country and a third of the country that really didn't care. So what I'm saying to you is, let's say people want to be free. It still doesn't mean that in Syria, in Libya, in, in, in Egypt, a small segment of the population, a third or less, could be the ones organizing, hiring these outside groups, and exploiting the yearning for freedom for their own ends. And I won't dispute you on that, Theo. You know I love you, and I'm happy to get into a debate. Uh, what I do dispute is that we have no co uh, concrete metrics as to what depth this extremism exists in these societies. We have no public opinion research which we can censure uh, our thinking on this. Pew Research has done some studies on this, but the methodology has proven in places like Iraq and Afghanistan is that overwhelmingly, on average, 90% of people aspire for the, free, for the notions of freedom and the institutions that safeguard freedom, parliament, judiciary, political parties, civil society, independent media. Uh, what is often at play is how subversive elements, whether it's an Iranian interest, and this is the straight talk, or regional neighbors like Pakistan and Afghanistan, mm -hmm. uh, or uh, autocratic elements uh, are, ex are, are attempting to exploit these processes to preserve their own power. But we know they're on the wrong side of history. We saw the Russian uh, Empire, if I could call it that, fall because they had based their stranglehold on power upon the idea that they could sustain this immense bureaucracy required to suppress the freedom of the people. Okay. And so Go ahead. I think in the long range, we do have that notion of freedom at play, even though it can be manipulated in the short term. Egypt. You have said, Shuv, that Egypt is the most advanced political laboratory in the world these days. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, think about what Egyptians had realized for themselves in a matter of about a month. They collapsed an order around uh, autocrats and hardlined Islamists, this dichotomy that has frozen the Middle East within a month. And they did this by understanding the power of peaceful resistance uh, and by taking to the streets. Nobody saw this coming. I I'm a big fan of the idea of balancing policy uh, with the realism of our national interest and the idealism of our highest aspirations in the world. Uh, nobody, no analyst, saw the rise of the people of Egypt uh, in the way that they had fashioned their movement or the discipline that they had had. And they innovated to get to this stage. They found this space on the internet uh, where they accessed the lessons of Eastern Europe and other democratic waves and transitions uh, and applied those into their own context using the best practices. Uh, anonymous associations made on uh, websites like Facebook uh, became hubs of political organization and are now converting into political parties. Um, you can look at hashtag January 25, Jan 25 as uh, a notional first political convention. Uh, you can look at hashtag Egypt as a notional political party. Uh, if you apply the metrics of what a convention and a political party are, some very interesting things are revealed. Uh, this analysis in this space has yet to uh, catch up with our foreign policy establishment in the West, often frozen in Cold War mindsets or in uh, instruments of Second World War industrial era uh, statecraft. Okay. This modernization needs to happen. And so in, e in Egypt, you're finding the most innovation uh, in the world when it comes to political mobilization. Okay. Now, you mentioned the idea of balancing what is practical with what is ideal in terms of our foreign policy. And in Egypt, what the West thought was practical was supporting the Hosni Mubarak regime and made him a very wealthy man in so doing. 
And right. the question that we asked, and it does, uh, it does pertain to what we talked about before the break, Shuv, is right. to what extent, whether they use you know, Facebook, MyFace, Twitter, what have you, to what extent is what replaced Mubarak or is replacing Mubarak an improvement? Because yes, it's interesting that, that there is a whole new way that they communicate in Egypt, but the question still remains, and you raised it yourself, is what we are doing practical by supporting a new regime in Egypt? Is it better than the Mubarak regime from our, for our purposes? And indeed, to the, to the extent that we want to appeal to idealism, will it be a freer country with a new regime, whether they use the internet or not? Well, Egyptian media are already participating today uh, and tomorrow in Dubai at the Arab Media Forum, uh, speaking to how they themselves have uh, converted and adapted to the role of this state, the need to be able to interrogate leadership. And that, that's starting to blossom in Egypt. Um, civil society is also beginning to find its voice. They've never had much space on the streets before, and so you're seeing an almost over-demonstration of uh, their new rights to assembly and to organize. I think protests in, in and around Egypt, and particularly Cairo and Alexandria, are a pretty regular happenstance, almost on a daily basis, uh, on sometimes what we might perceive to be the most mundane issues. Um, but I don't know if you can answer that question in a short-term context. Democracy is not born overnight. It comes over a grueling process, uh, a maturing of an electorate, uh, the ability of parties to compete. Uh, I do get frustrated when policy leaders uh, and thinkers place very short-term timetables to meet uh, a quick fix demand because I think it subverts the idea of democracy being seated properly and allowing organizations to be able to compete in the marketplace of ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm finding that a lot of organizations are, are demonstrating discipline. They need more time to be effective against some of the more established apparatus of autocratic parties and Islamist organizations. But I think that they're on the side of the majority of their people if they can get their act together. Okay, we just got about half a minute left. I want to touch on one more thing. As I mentioned, you're director of the, the Haraya Initiative, Ending Tyranny Through Freedom in the 20, in 21st Century Statecraft. And you have said that freedom in your view, is the end game in the war on terror. And we've talked about this once before, Shuv. This program asks Absolutely. people to contemplate what the end of the war on terror looks like. You say it's freedom, but expand on that, would you please? In just a few seconds, uh, f freedom is a generational obligation. It's what uh, has been transferred in the West through mantles of leadership from one generation to the next. Uh, and this expansion and invigoration of freedom around the world is the end game on the war on terror. When Groups like Al Qaeda and other Islamic uh, hegemonic actors uh, f fail to continue to fill the space of ungoverned areas um, and become more marginalized groups in societies governed by the rule of law and constitutions. That is the end game, and it is a long range game. This is nothing we can expect to achieve overnight, nor should we delude ourselves to thinking it will happen overnight. He is Shuv the Groove Majumder. He is our <laughs> foreign policy contributor. He joins us from Ottawa. Thank you, buddy, for being with us. Appreciate it, Theo. All right. <laughs>